Okay, here's our next little bit in our journey into understanding um, particle physics. So we've nearly everything that we've mentioned so far is a matter particle. Today we've got to talk about antimatter. You might think antimatter is some kind of science fiction thing that somebody invented, but no, it's a very real kind of material. We've mentioned one antimatter particle so far. We've mentioned a uh, positron. Okay, we need to have a better definition of what antimatter is, and we need to know how it's made, and we need to know what happens when antimatter and matter meet. Um, something that you, I'm sure you'll have heard the equation, E equals mc squared, that's um, quite relevant to what we're doing today. So the symbols in E equals mc squared, E is for energy, m is for mass, and c is for the speed of light squared. The speed of light squared, therefore, is just a number that you put into that equation. And what that tells you is that energy and mass are really two kind of aspects of the same idea. You can turn energy into mass, you can turn mass into energy. Um, they're interchangeable quantities in physics. Okay, that's what really that equation means. So um, that what that means, for example, is if you take a kilogram of water at 0 degrees C and you boil it, even if none of it evaporates, so you get it in a sealed container, it's all still there afterwards, you've got to put in 4,200 joules to make one kilogram one degree C hotter, so 100 times that to make it 100 degrees C hotter. So you put in 4.2 times 10 to the 5 joules, even if it starts off as exactly one kilogram, right? the mass will increase according to m equals e over c squared, there's the energy we've put in, here's the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared, so its mass will increase by 4.7 times 10 to the minus 12 kilograms. Okay, now clearly that's not an amount that you would notice if you were lifting a kettle up, All right, but it is a real thing. On our human scale we don't really notice that happening, but on an atomic level, or a subatomic level, then it can have some interesting consequences. So here's antimatter. Every particle of matter, every type of matter particle that exists has got an antimatter equivalent. Okay, things about the antimatter, it's got the same mass, so there are no negative masses involved in any of this. Okay, if you've got an electron and a positron, they've both got the same mass. Well, 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms for both of them. Okay, but other properties are opposite. So we already know that a positron is a positively charged particle, an antimatter particle, which is very much like the electron. It's got the same mass. Okay, um, It's also got quite an annoying name because most antiparticles are much more logically named. So, for example, a proton's got an antimatter equivalent. It's called the antiproton. The neutron's got an antiparticle equivalent. It's called the antineutron. This makes it a bit tricky with a positron because you might easily f not notice that's an antiparticle. Okay, but unfortunately it was discovered as the first antimatter particle, so people hadn't developed a system for naming these particles, didn't really understand what they were until um, later when they could give them a more systematic naming. Okay, if you want a symbol for these things, again, generally speaking, what you do is you just put a bar on the top. So here's a proton. If it's an antiproton, you stick a bar over it. Again, the positron's a bit annoying because you, people just tend to write a beta for a beta particle like an electron and a plus instead of a minus or an elect an E and a plus. So if you see E plus, there's no bar, but remember that is an antiparticle. Okay, so how do we make um, antiparticles? What we do is we collide things with and we turn that energy into particles. Okay, but we can't just make any particle we want. We've got to have enough energy and also we've got to obey some rules. We'll talk about conservation rules much later, but um, a basic one to get a start is the conservation of charge. So you can't just make a positron. Okay, The only way you can make a positron is if you've got a negatively charged particle as well being made at the same time. So in the example we had, if you remember, we're turning a proton into a neutron. So we've lost the positive charge of the proton. It's turned into the positive charge of the positron, but the total charge stays the same. Okay, This is our first real look at conservation laws, which will become very important in a couple of lessons' time. Um, if you put a particle and antiparticle together, then they annihilate, and what we do is we turn the, e the mass into energy, and that energy comes in the form of two photons. We'll talk about why those two photons um, in a minute, but you get pure energy in the form of photons. Okay, but we have to, this will always obey the conservation laws because they've got opposite properties in the first place. Okay, so if you've got an electron 
and a positron and you collide them together and they disappear and just form into energy, then you know you've obeyed the conservation laws because they've got opposite properties in the first place. So I've got a negative thing and a positive thing. Afterwards, I've got no charge. Well, I had no charge overall in the first place. So here's our little animation. I've got an electron and a positron. They're antiparticles. They hit each other. They collide. We get two photons come whizzing out. Okay, if I have a proton and antiproton and they collide, then I get much more energy. The reason we've got two photons is if you notice in the first place, these have got the same mass travel in opposite directions. The total momentum is zero. If the total momentum before is zero, the total momentum afterwards has to be zero. Uh, photons actually have momentum, so if I only had one, I'd have some momentum. So you need to have two photons going in opposite directions in order for the total momentum to still be zero. OK, we can look at this a bit more mathematically. So the total energy released and the annihilation of an electron and a positron, well, we know these two masses. So the total mass that we've destroyed is two lots of 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31. There's our number. Multiply that by um, the speed of light squared from E equals mc squared. We get 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. If we annihilate a proton with an antiproton, OK, the total mass loss is much bigger because we've got um, I've got 1.67 in here, but 1.66. All right, so we get 3 times 10 to the minus 10 joules. Okay, the more mass we annihilate, the more energy we produce. If we want to make particles, then the way you do this is you fire a high-energy photon. Uh, one way at least to do it is to fire a high-energy photon at a nucleus. Okay, so here's my high-energy photon. It's going to hit this nucleus of an atom that energy turns into mass and we can make two particles. right? But again, we'll have to make usually two particles because this is a particle you've never heard of, a pi plus. Okay, Here's its antiparticle, a pi minus. We'll talk about these um, particles called mesons soon. So here's two particles, but they must obey the conservation laws. Hopefully you can see they obey the conservation of, char of charge because that one's positive and that one's negative. Okay, but if we want to do that, how much energy do we need? Well, the mass of a pi plus is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 28. If we want to do this process called pair production, we want to make the two particles, so the total mass. Okay, notice I haven't told you the mass of a pi minus, but hopefully you can see they must have the same mass because it's they're a particle-antiparticle pair. So I'm making this much mass. Okay, how much energy do I need? We'll do mc squared. I need 4.5 times 10 to the minus 11 joules of energy. Okay, these are very light particles. Okay, if I want to make heavier particles, I need to put more and more energy in. So the Large Hadron Collider, um, when it was first built at CERN in the, 19, uh, the 1970s, it did its famous experiment in 1980 to find this particle called the W particle and the Z particle. But the W particle had got a mass of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 25 kilograms. Okay, the energy you needed to make that was 1.26 times 10 to the minus 8 joules. That looks like quite a small amount of energy, but remember that's got to be the that's got to be the energy on a subatomic level. So you need to make things go pretty fast to form that amount of energy. Now we need 8 tera electron volts. This is 8 times 10 to minus sorry 8 times 10 to the plus 12 electron volts. Okay, that could make a particle in the new accelerator with a mass of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 23 kilograms. Okay, that's quite a heavy particle if you think about it. Okay, that's um, a thousand times the mass, sorry, 10,000 times the mass of a proton.